Hi, everybody. So today we are officially going to be starting chapter nine. We finished chapter five. So if we take a look at the assignments on Moodle, lecture 22 covered section 5.4. And we're coming down here to lecture number 23, where we're going to start talking about chapter nine. Now, the reason that we skip ahead from nine from five to nine is that the math involved in chapter nine is a lot more similar to the math in chapter five than the in-between chapters. But we will come back and do, after we finish up on chapter nine, uh, we come back and we do chapters six and seven and eight. And then that will get us down to the final exam. Um, so after we do chapter nine, we're gonna have a quiz. It'll be the similar to the quiz that we had over chapters uh, one and two, where it's just one problem that you do on your own. It is, it, it, there is a time limit on it, but you'll do the quiz and then um, you'll take a picture of your work and email it to me immediately after. Or another idea that I just, I don't know why this didn't dawn on me before, is underneath the quiz button, I can put a submit your work for your quiz button and then you can just send it to that Moodle location. Maybe that would be easier for everybody, including me. Keep me more organized. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do then today is uh, we're going to start talking about chapter nine and the topic of chapter nine is a moment of inertia. Now, a moment of inertia is primarily a mathematical concept, but there are lots of engineering applications. But it's a common question to ask, what is a moment of inertia? And it's not a difficult question to answer, but it's one that has a variety of uh, of application and application based answers. So I'm going to develop it in this particular way. What is, and I always abbreviate it MOI, okay? So what is a moment of inertia? Well, basically, if we start with Newton's second law of motion, which says that the summation of forces in any direction is equal to the mass of an object times the acceleration of that object. We can think about mass as opposing translational motion. Meaning that the more mass an object has, the more force it requires to accelerate that object. Or in other words, force is uh, causes motion and mass opposes the motion or not opposes in the sense of a force, but it, it's something that has to be overcome. Uh, let's, so let me just phrase this a little bit differently. Mass must be overcome to allow translational motion. That's a little bit better because then we're not really thinking of it. It's not a force. It's just, it's like a glob of something that opposes the motion. So in this way, mass can be thought of as inertia or inertia is that desire to not move. So inertia is also a term that we often use uh, just in everyday sense. And so let's just look up a definition of the word inertia. Um, and it means uh, a tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. So that's what I think is a great definition. Inertia is a tendency to do nothing or remain unchanged. So if we extrapolate that definition to a vector mechanic sense of the word, we can say that mass is the tendency to just stay where you are, to not accelerate. 
So uh, we have to overcome the, the, that desire for inertia by applying a force in order to create an acceleration. All right. Well, this refers to F equals MA is talking about translational motion. And by translational, I mean uh, X, Y, Z directions where something moves in a straight line or in a curved line, uh, but we're not talking about a full-on rotation. Well, if we sort of develop this concept into the idea of a rotation. So, for example, if we have a wheel, a tire on a car, okay, and we spin it, we want it to spin, okay? Uh, the equation force equals mass times acceleration doesn't really get us where we need to go, but we know that a force crossed with a moment arm is equal to some sort of a moment, and we could say that that's about the center, for example. And so if we do that, we could say maybe the summation of forces crossed with R is also equal to some idea of inertia um, crossed with some sort of an acceleration. And it turns out that that acceleration um, that we're talking about in this case is an angular acceleration. So we have um, an angular acceleration which measures how quickly something increases its rotational speed or velocity. Uh, and that the inertia, you can think about that, if you have a wheel and it's up on a jack, it's not really the mass of the wheel precisely, because if you have a nice round wheel, it's going to spin differently, or the opposition to that spin is going to be different than if it's a very lumpy wheel, if it's got all kinds of weird danglies hanging on it, and if the mass is concentrated here, or if the mass is concentrated here. So it turns out that in the case of moment, equals something times alpha, that something is not mass, but rather is a moment of inertia. And so the symbol is I, and I always abbreviate it because I end up writing it 5,000 times, MOI, um, depends not only on mass, but on the distribution of mass, which sounds an awful lot like that first moment that we talked about the Q values. Right, so you can have an object that has, just in the sense that you have a, I'm trying to look, I'm looking for something that might be a good visual aid. I'm not gonna be able to find one, so I'll just draw something. Um, if you have mass, you have a point mass, the mass is just the mass, and when you push on it, it's going to oppose motion in all the same ways. But if you have something that's very symmetrical, and you rotate it about the middle, that is going to rotate differently than if you're rotating it about a point here. So in other words, if you have it on a spindle that goes right through the middle, you spin it, it's going to spin pretty easily and smoothly, right? What if you try to spin it here? If the spindle, yeah, it's going to be lumpy, isn't it? It's going to be a lumpy rotation. That means that the moment of inertia here is less than the moment of inertia here. So the mass didn't change, but the distribution of mass about the point you're pivoting it has changed. Yes, absolutely. Now that's another good point too. The moment of inertia about this point because of symmetry is going to be the same as the moment of inertia about this point, right? So up or down doesn't matter. Remember Q, the first moment could be positive or negative depending on whether the area was negative uh, or whether something was above or below. With the moment of inertia, it's positive no matter what. So. When well, we know about the positive, the moment of inertia, the moment of inertia of any real object is never zero. Remember, Q is equal to zero about the centroid. But uh, the moment of inertia is never equal to zero. It's always positive. 
but it differs in value uh, depending on the axis of rotation or it in, depends on where. All right, and if you look at this, once again, we know that Q, first moment, is zero about the centroid. And I, the moment of inertia, is not zero, but it is a minimum about the centroid. So the smallest value of the moment of inertia will always be found when an object is rotating about its own centroid. That will be the smoothest, the least lumpy, or the one that opposes the rotation the least if you have it pivoted about its centroid. That's where everything's going to be as smooth as possible. Now, for a circle or a sphere, if we were doing a three-dimensional thing, or a cylinder, the location of the centroid is quite clear. But if you have something that is irregular shaped, some of the stuff we've drawn, like this, if you can locate the centroid and you find it to be here, if you were to pivot there, you would find the moment of inertia about that point. That would be the minimum. And so if you found the inertia of an object about its centroid, there's always going to be some quantity that you can add to that to move it to another location, okay? And we'll discuss that. But in the first part, in section 5.1, we are first going to be talking about uh, determination of the moment of an area. Once again, we're talking about mass, but if we have a, um, if we have a, uh, if we have something that where the weight is distribute where the density and the thickness are the same, we can talk about areas and we sort of eliminate uh, some of the issues with with computation. So we can get a lot of information about something based upon the discussion of the moment of inertia of the area. When you have a bar here, that means the moment of inertia about its centroid, centroidal axis, okay? So that would be, like, for what I'm doing, it would be right here. If this is my y bar and this is my x bar, okay? Now, if you just have i, say, for example, about x, that is the moment of inertia of this object about the x axis. So in other words, we always have to define where we're taking the moment about. And of course, IY would be the moment of inertia about the y-axis. Right? So just like with a moment, we always have to define the point we take a moment about. We always have to define the axis that we take a moment of inertia about. Now similarly, we know the first moments, which we did in Chapter 5, this is 9.1, sorry, uh, in chapter 5. We know that Q sub X is the integral of Y dA, or it's equal to the summation of those individual Y bar, A bars. And we also know that Q sub Y is equal to the integral of X dA, which is equal to the summation of the individual components. All right? Now, when we talk about the moment of inertia, we can also call the moment of inertia the second moment um, or the moment of the moment. So you can probably see why we call it moment of inertia because both of those are sort of sloppy sounding terms. But the moment of the moment, well, if this is the first moment, the second moment looks like this, and that's equal to I sub X. So I sub X is equal to the integral of Y dA, and I sub Y is equal to the integral of X squared dA. And doing composite shapes, 
uh, is a little bit different. In this case, it's a little bit simpler to do a moment based on direct integration. A moment of inertia, that is. All right. So I will just work one problem. Oh, certainly. So sorry. Got carried away. There we go. Yep. Yeah, you betcha. All right. So once again, there's, there's also one difference with this. When you do an element, when we talk about an elemental analysis with this, in other words, when we're doing it by direct integration, moment of inertia by direct integration. It's always better if you have some curve like this. It's always better, easier, if you're doing an I sub Y to view the element this way so that it's equal to an X squared dA. But if you're using the same function or the same, the same thing, except now you want to get um, an I sub X, which is equal to the integral of Y squared dA, it's better to turn your element and to do them as two separate problems, which I'm going to do. I'll show you how to do this. If you don't do this, um, you end up with a double integral, and it's just easy to make a mistake. So, uh, so do we need to find the centroid first and then mm -hmm. the other part? Or is that Not unless they ask you for the moment of inertia about the centroid. Okay. okay. In this case, we're just going to talk about getting it about the axes. Then we'll expand that conversation. Absolutely. To what do you do then? If you've got, okay, so now I know how to do that. Now, now where's my centroid and what does that mean to me? All right. And so, you yeah. The double integral, is that just like doing the integral twice? It kind of is. And I'm not going to teach that to you today. I'm going to teach you to rotate the element. And then we'll talk, we can talk about that as well. You're asking excellent questions. Um, but in order to keep it as simple as possible and to always have a straightforward way to solve it, I'm going to teach it this way. And then we'll talk about that and I'll teach you the other way. But I'm glad you're asking the question because that means you're just one step ahead or five steps ahead. So good job. All right. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, there are some problems. I'm going to do problem 9.1. And problem 9.1 says determine by direct integration the moment of inertia of the shaded axis with respect to the y-axis, the shaded area with respect to the y-axis. And then for problem number five, it asks you to find it with respect to the x-axis. All right. So first of all, I'm going to say with respect to the y-axis. And then I'll turn it the other way and I'll show you what to do. All right. So problem 9.1 looks like this. It's a spandrel of some sort. And I'm told that the function y is equal to some constant k times x minus a squared. So that's a parabola of some sort. Okay? This is my y-axis. This is my x-axis. I want to find it with respect to the y-axis. So I draw an element that looks like this. And this is my value of x. Okay? So I know that I sub y is equal to the integral of x squared dA. x is just x. Uh, I need to find a value for that k. This is b, and this is a. So I can find the value for k by substituting in. If I substitute in, I could say 0 and b, right? Because there's a point 0, b is on the spandrel, 0 comma b is on the curve. So what is the value of k? I can substitute in b is equal to k times 0 minus a quantity squared. Negative a squared is just a squared. So I get b is equal to a squared times k, or k is equal to b over a squared. Right. So that just means I can simplify this equation by saying y is equal to b over a squared times x minus a quantity squared. 
All right. Now for my DA element then, um, my differential quantity is in the x direction, so I can call that dx times y. Okay. My limits, since I have a dx element, are going to go from a to 0. And I have x and I have y as a function of x. So I can plug that in. And see, this is quite similar to the math in chapter 5. So I have x squared. My y value looks like this. And there's my differential. So I've written out my expression here. Um, b over a squared is a constant, so I can come outside of my integral. So I have x squared times, and I would just simplify this. I would just expand that polynomial. So that's x squared minus 2ax plus a squared dx. So I get b over a squared. I'm going to distribute that through. I'm just going to do this over here. This would be b over a squared times, if I use the distributed prop with t, I get x to the fourth minus 2a times x to the third plus a squared x squared dx. So then when I integrate, I get x to the fifth over 5 minus 2a x to the fourth over 4 plus a squared x to the third over 3, all evaluated at a and 0. All right. So when I plug in, the first thing I can see is on my lower limit, since I have an x to some power to some power in the numerator of every term, the lower limit's going to go to zero. So this is going to be b over a squared times the quantity a to the fifth over five minus two a to the fifth over four plus a to the fifth over 3. And this is still IY. IY equals. All right, now I can multiply this A squared through, and I can end up with uh, getting rid of it in each of these terms. So I get B A to the third over 5 minus 2B a to the third over 4 plus b a to the third over 3. Okay. Then I need to get a common denominator. I have a 5, a 4, and a 3, no common factors. So that means that my common denominator is going to be 5 times 4 times 3, which is 12 times 5, or 60. So to get that common denominator, this is going to multiply by five, 4 times 3, which is 12. So I have 12ba to the third minus 2 times 5 times 3. 5 times 3 is 15 times 2 is 30ba. That should say to the third, sorry, third. And then the last one, uh, plus, uh, I'm going to multiply 5 by 4, which is 20, 20 b a to the third. So I have uh, 12 plus 20, which is 32 minus 32 b a to the third over the common denominator of 60, or b a to the third over 30 is equal to my i y. All right. Now, a couple of important points. The first is, is that we've kept this just as a literal equation. But the other is the units of an area moment of inertia are area to the fourth power. So b times a to the third is length to the fourth. So I said area to the fourth. I mean to say length to the fourth. And if you go back here and you look at the original equations, x squared is length squared. 
times area is length squared, so length squared times length squared is length to the fourth. So your terms, your moments should always come out in dimensions of length to the fourth. Okay. So now, let's rotate that element and find um, I sub X. Right. It is, except we're going to have to ro rotate that element, so we're going to have to get a different. Uh, we're going to have to. That's right. We're going to rotate. We're going to right. We're going to solve it for y, or we're going to solve it for x, and have the expression in terms of y. Absolutely. See, you're asking great questions, so that's very good. All right, so let's rotate our element. Same spandrel. Now our element looks like this. And this is in terms of y. We know that uh, when I rewrote the equation, I know that y is equal to b over a squared times x minus a squared. If I want to solve that for x, because this is going to be an x limit, isn't it? My dA element is going to be equal to an x, this minus this, dy. Okay? So uh, I could say, let's do it this way. Y, I'm going to multiply by this, times a squared over b is equal to x minus a quantity squared. If I take the square root of both of those sides, I'm going to get, this is going to come out as an a times the square root of y over b is equal to x minus a. It's actually going to be a plus or minus, isn't it? So then I get x is equal to a plus or minus a times the square root of y over b. All right, now that's a pretty functional equation, but it'd probably be better to write it in terms of powers. Um, maybe factor the a out. So I could say, because if I factor an a out, that's just going to be 1. So I could say a, I don't know if I want to do that or not. Let's just say plus or minus a y to the 1 half over b to the 1 half. All right equals x. That looks a little bit more manageable to me in terms of putting it into that integral. All right, so then we get i sub x. This is actually problem 9.5. Um, i sub x is going to equal the integral of y squared dA. y is just y. But now my dA is an x dy element. So that's going to be y squared times x which is a plus or minus a y to the one half over b to the one half dy. And then since my, my limits are y, and it's not zero to a, it's going to be zero to b this time. Okay. So then, I did that wrong. B's up here, zero's down here. Sorry about that. Okay, so then I would multiply through, and I would get the integral from b to 0 of a y squared plus or minus a y to the 5 halves over b to the 1 half dy. All right, so continuing, this is a y to the third over 3 plus or minus a y to the 7 halves over 7 halves b to the 1 half evaluated at b and 0. Alright. Make sure I have everything on there. All right, so now, once again, I have a y in the numerator, so my lower limit is going to go to 0. So I'm just left with a b to the third over 3 plus or minus a b to the 7 halves over 7 halves b to the 1 half. This will simplify to 6 halves, which is just b to the third. 
So I get a b to the third over 3 plus or minus, this is going to invert because it's a re reciprocal in the numerator, so this will be 2 over 7 ab to the third. And this is i sub x. All right. So once again, we need to get a common denominator, which here is going to be 21. So this is 7 a b to the third plus or minus, multiply this by 6 a b to the third over 21. So i sub x is either 13 a b to the third over 21 or um, 1 a b to the third over 21. Okay, and physically one of those is going to have meaning and one is not. So we would go back to the original uh, equation and decide which one would make more sense. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be this one, but I could be wrong. It might be that one. 13 over 21, I sub X. 13 over 21, let me look at this. No. It would probably be easier if we put numbers in there to see which way it would look. But if it's 13 over 21, AB to the third, about the x-axis, let's compare it to the y-axis, the a to the third over 30. I'm pretty sure it's going to be this. So if we just do Maybe all not. those yeah. calculations, mm -hmm. Brian, could we just like say a is worth 2 and yes. 3 and just plug it into what happens? Yes. I also wanted to do this with not, with the literal equation because it's uh, like a thousand times harder. But if, and I just wanted you to have that in your notes. But yes, absolutely. You can always plug in numbers. Um, and you can approximate. I wouldn't choose the same number. Like I wouldn't choose A and B to be both four because sometimes you'll just get a little, it'll just be a little strange that way. There's no reason to think they're the same is what I'm getting at. But yeah, I would definitely consider that. And then you would have a different value. You would have a number value for K. And yeah, so that would be uh, one way to work it out. So could you start at the beginning with just plugging in? Some I would do that to tell you the okay. truth, yeah. I mean, I would consider doing that. And on exams, or like I said, I wanted you to have an example with a literal equation, um, but on your exams and your quizzes, I will definitely put in numbers. I think it lends itself to more meaning that way. But as a purely mathematical exercise, it's just a good idea to have one of these in your notes. All right, you guys have any questions? All righty, well, that covers section... Um, 5.1, we talked about moments of inertia with respect to the x and the y axis. We need to cover a little bit more in section 5.1 to talk about polar moments and uh, just about a point is what a polar moment is, but they're quite easy to execute mathematically after you do the i sub x and i sub y. So that's where I'll start on uh, Friday, and we'll just continue marching through chapter 9, and I will uh, make sure... Yeah, that the homework for this for chapter five will be due Friday. So we'll have time. If you have questions on your homework, you can bring them on Friday. And otherwise, um, I'll just go ahead and do another lecture on chapter nine. So you guys have a wonderful day. We'll see you later. <laughs>